As we mentioned in the previous episode, several lines of Eutherian mammals had survived the age of the dinosaurs to inherit a world all their own, full of new opportunities to explore. And they did. The earliest periods of the Cenozoic era saw an unprecedented proliferation of new forms in most of these lineages, especially among hooved animals. Hooves are relatively simple structures, little more than just really thick toenails, and they've evolved independently at least two or three times just within eutherians as well as in one line of marsupials too. Tracing our family tree of life back to Boreu eutheria about 100 million years ago, remember that our branch is Euarchontiglyres, leading to archontids and on to primates. But now we're going to talk about Laurasia therians. Fairy ungulata represents a split between fairy, that's the earliest pangolins and early carnivorans, which we'll talk about in another episode, and ungulata, the line that developed hooves instead of claws. This group in the middle are the mesonychids, carnivorous predators that started out with five toes like all other mammals did, but ended up on four hooves. These were among the first predators to emerge in the Paleocene, and they were gone by the Oligocene. Today, we're looking at true ungulates, euungulata. We'll talk about perissodactyls in the next episode. In this one, we'll look at setartiodactyls. And most of this lineage lost their thumb toes, and they still walk around on four hooves. And that's usually cloven hooves, meaning two forward and two back. Except for Tylopoda. Some of that group lost their outside or back toes, so they're down to just two. This is where we have camels and gobi hyas, which are like llamas, except that they still have all four toes, and sharp canine teeth, as lots of hooved animals did back then, having evolved from originally omnivorous opportunists that needed their fangs. This is another branch that still had those teeth too, at least initially. This is where we find pigs, for example, which is a much bigger group than I can show here. And just beyond them, we come to an important division. One side leads to ruminants, animals that have lost their fangs, or at least most of them have, and they rely on incisors to cut grass and leaves and on molars to grind them. And their stomachs have been divided into chambers to better digest plant material. Here we have sheep, goats, cattle and deer, beginning with something that looks like all of the above, and also we have a host of odd-looking things that eventually lead to giraffes. And aside from the ruminants, between them and the pigs, or what will become pigs, is another offshoot that kept those sharp teeth and look a bit like pigs, or rather what pigs might look like if they were primarily predatory. Among them are intimidating beasts like Andrew Sarkis and Intelodonts, also known as hell pigs, along with Echinodon, which looks a bit like a hippo pig. And that's not too far off, because the adjoining branch on this tree includes hippopotamus. Hippos and pigs are the only hooved animals we have left that still have those big sharp teeth like meat eaters have, even though they're mostly plant eaters now. There used to be a lot more sharp toothed ungulates. And even though hippos are technically hooved animals, they're surprisingly good swimmers. Which leads us to the next category that I'm eager to show you. Remember that according to both the fossil record and the molecular clock of genetic comparison, all these divisions within Sidartiodactyls began immediately after the Cretaceous extinction, in what was a rapid diversification into a wide range of environmental niches left vacant in the absence of the dinosaurs. And for the most part, we're only talking about the biggest beasts. And not everything was big, and even the biggest things started out small. Pigs, deer, giraffes, even hippos started out small. And not everything in each group necessarily became extra large later on. For example, in this next group, the now extinct lineage of Dicobinoidea show a sort of transition between what would become hippos and what would become whales. And some people, myself included, have been confused by the surprising fact that hippos are genetically the closest living relatives to whales, as if whales supposedly evolved from hippos. That is especially confusing for those who don't realize that hippos are technically hooved animals. I've seen illustrations implying that whales were supposed to have evolved from cows instead, because that's what most people think of as hooved animals, whatever they know about. Except that these were hooved predators, and we don't have hooved predators anymore, and we never had carnivorous cows. Before anyone knew how to compare genomic sequences, whales were traditionally said to have evolved from mesonychids, some of which looked vaguely wolf-like. Except for the hooves, of course. How can you have meat-eating predators with hooves? We don't have anything like that anymore. No one's ever seen one alive. So it's hard for most people to imagine, and that's why I'll try to clarify. 
Remember that at one point, what would become hippos and what would become whales both started out looking very much alike, having a common ancestor that itself evolved from a generalized omnivore like a shrew. So the crown of all three of these groups would have looked a bit like this. This is Indohyus, one of the most basal cetacean morphs, meaning hooved predators with a number of adaptations that are otherwise unique to whales. In particular, the shape of the inner ear is diagnostic of cetaceans, that only whales have that, well, except for this odd thing, so there must be a relation there. And their teeth aren't as differentiated as they are in other mammals. Modern cetaceans have reverted to a primitive pattern of uniform conical teeth like reptiles typically have because fish are slippery and piscivores tend to evolve this sort of dentition for that reason. This and other evidence indicates that Indohyus lived on land but hunted in the water. And even though this raccoon-sized piggy thing looks completely different than what usually comes to mind when we think of whales, remember that there's a lot of intermediate stages between these two beginning with Pachycetus. And despite its small size, it had heavy bones common in animals that spend a lot of time underwater, which it evidently did, as indicated by its shark-like teeth, but also the placement of its eyes on top of its head, a bit like an alligator or a hippo. And here we see the skull of Pachycetus compared to that of a pygmy hippo, except that the image of the hippo has been elongated a bit, making the two look exactly identical. So Pachycetus was like a tiny, long-tailed hippo hiding in the water, pretending to be a crocodile. Embulocetus, the walking whale, which is the next generation, was a much bigger version of Pachycetus, except that it had to spend a lot more time in the water, where it too was evidently an ambush predator, being as awkward as an alligator on land. And one thing that cetaceans retained, that all other artiodactyls lost, was a powerful tail. Every other member of this group reduced theirs to little more than a fly swatter. One reason why cetaceans never reduced theirs was that they could still use it when swimming. It was a very strong tail, which implies that it may have been flattened into a paddle like a beaver's tail. And whether that began with Pachycetus or with Ambulocetus, we don't know, but it must have been the case by the time we get to our next intermediate. Cuchocetus had an even more powerful tail than Ambulocetus, and that means they used it. And notice also that the hind legs are greatly reduced. These were not powerful limbs. They were basically just landing gear, most often used when holding still to hide in shallow water. Cuchocetus couldn't walk any better than an alligator, so this animal could have filled that niche too, but it was also evidently so well adapted for swimming long distances that it might not have had to come out of the water ever again. Skipping more of the same, we come to Duradon, which was an well, obviously an obligate swimmer, unable to walk anymore at all. The front legs are half as long as they used to be, and the back legs are almost gone. And notice also that the nostrils have moved from the end of the snout up closer to the eyes. And jumping ahead to the erroneously named Bacillosaurus, formerly Zeuglodon, and the hind legs are no more than just a pair of flippers. And this catches us up to the mid to late Eocene, where we are now in our series some 40 million years ago. Later whales lost those hind flippers, but they still begin to develop in embryo before they're reabsorbed, becoming just a few small disconnected bones in the pelvic region. But on very rare occasions, those hind flippers might reappear as atavisms. So that's how the literal leviathans that we know as whales evolved from diminutive deer-like long-tailed hippo pigs pretending to be crocodiles. And some folks consider that a controversial subject, but not as controversial as where we are now in this series. Because the clade we're talking about today is one that everyone, scientists and spiritualists alike, all object to. In the last episode, we said there were only two choices of what type of primate to be, haplorine or strepsorine. And we are haplorine primates because we have dry noses and reduced olfactory abilities. But at this point in the late Eocene, Haplorhini has divided into two groups, too. On one side are Tarsiers, and on the other side, the only other choice is Anthropoidea, also known as Simiaforms. They're represented by Eosimius, the very first of its kind that we know of, though there are many other species, too, including Parapithecoids that we'll talk about next time. The criteria to belong to this group are as follows. First, you have to be a dry-nosed or Haplorhine primate, of course, but then you have to have some other features, too like the lack of sensory whiskers that cats, rats, and lemurs have. Now, sensory whiskers are different than regular hairs. Anthropoids, or simiaforms, also have to have two pectoral mammae, and they have to be pectoral, 
atop the pectoral muscles, where nearly every other animal has more than that, and they're usually in the abdomen. And lemurs have up to six memories, like dogs or cats do too, but simiforms have only two, and they're up on the chest because that's where we hold our babies. Another difference between us and lemurs is that the penis is naked and pendulous, meaning that it's not a red rocket tethered to the abdomen in a furry sheath the way it is on most mammals, most obviously the family dog. We also see in color where most animals don't, and that's a huge advantage when you live in trees and eat fruit, when you don't have to track anything down by its scent anymore, which is why we lost that ability, but where knowing the difference between red, yellow, and green determines whether fruit is good to eat or not. On top of that is the relative size of the brain of anthropoid primates. It is significantly larger than that of most other animals, most other mammals, giving simiaforms special abilities, including at least a degree of language comprehension. Some troops have demonstrated that particular grunts and calls have specific meanings and elicit predicted reactions, especially calls to flee to the trees or get down to the ground. They also have the capacity for deliberate deception, which I think may be unique in the animal kingdom. Simiaforms are so intelligent that they can learn how to recognize their own reflection in a mirror and know that it is them, which is something that only dolphins, elephants, and very few birds can do. No other animal is smart enough to realize or eventually figure out that that's not just another dog or cat or what have you, that the face looking back at you is you. Because anthropoids, as the name implies, have a sense of self and even an eerie awareness of their own mortality. They have been observed to behave in a manner that implies that more than any other animal, maybe even elephants, anthropoids know what death is, and they're afraid of the concept of it, just the same way we are. What makes this controversial is that the name Anthropoidea means that it includes humans and human-like or anthropoid primates. But simiaforms, which is the other equally valid name for this exact same group, means not necessarily human-like, but taking on the form of simians. Now, what does the word simian mean? That's what makes it controversial. It's a well-known colloquial word and a verifiable truth, but it's also an uncomfortable admission. The word is funky, skunky. Man, what a hard label to wear. We know it's true, you know it's you, but you don't want to admit that's what we are, because even when people can readily accept that they are primates who meet all the criteria of a pendulous penis and pectoral mammy with color vision and a brilliant mind and self-awareness, all in trade of a mere loss of whiskers, call it anything else, but don't make us admit that 